I'm here with Pauline Oliveros. She is a renowned teacher, composer, and musician. We'll be talking about practicing her form of meditation called deep listening, which evolved directly from her musical discipline. Welcome, Pauline. Thank you. It's nice to have you here. Nice to be here. So we're going to be practicing in this segment um, deep listening. So mm -hmm. tell me, what is deep listening? Yes, well, that's a good question. Uh, mm -hmm. Sometimes I say I don't know. <laughs> so we can just go home now. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, well, deep listening comes from my fascination with listening, and um, uh, there was uh, there is a recording which we have here on the stand uh, called "Deep Listening," um, and this recording was made in a uh, an underground cistern, fourteen feet down in. Uh, and this cistern it had us a, a reverberation time, which is 45 seconds, which is rather long, yes? So you can play a sound, and uh, it, it is there. It's present uh, for 45 seconds. So if you're a trombone player, like Stuart Dempster, who was my uh, partner in this venture, he can play his trombone put it down and pick up his didgeridoo and play that, and the trombone is still sounding. You know, it's like a, a hall of mirrors, but they're audio. So uh, we were in this environment, and uh, I had I had gone there just to visit it, just to listen to it. And uh, But we, as an afterthought, took a recording engineer with us. Um, and so we recorded for like five hours after we got down there. And uh, afterwards, uh, we listened to what we had recorded and decided we had an, an album. And so it was released uh, a year later by New Albion Records. And uh, we had to name the album. And so uh, I thought of deep listening. And because we were uh, inveterate punsters, uh, we liked the title because we we thought, well, we were pretty deep underground. <laughs> so deep listening was and, how it came and about. And what were you doing in the cistern underground? I mean, listening, just listening. But what? We, who? Who? You were thinking of doing some musical production there. We and, were not thinking. Oh, you just were visiting. <laughs> we were visiting. Thought maybe something. Maybe. Well, yeah, maybe we better take a recording engineer. With but this is a very unusual uh, listening space. Mm -hmm. right. So then, um, so you did the recording, and yeah. you you and you put it out as an album. And then, how did it evolve into something outside of the musical sphere? Well, because uh, uh, I wrote in in the album liner notes, you know, about the way we were listening and how we had to listen to one another, but that. Uh, we also had to listen to the cistern itself because it was giving us so much feedback. Um, it was a different way of listening, and we had to listen in order to be able to play at all. So it, it, it gave us a new information. And uh, as I said, it, it was kind of a joke that we called it deep listening, but then it began to make sense. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And so uh, from there, uh, I mean, we always uh, were, were interested in how a space sounds. But from then, I mean, we were always listening to different performance spaces for their characteristics. And so uh, we uh, named ourselves the Deep Listening Band. <laughs> and uh, we just recorded um, uh, our 25th anniversary uh, recording in a uh, simulation of the cistern, electronic simulation, because it wasn't a very good place to take an audience. <laughs> and besides, if you took an audience into that space, it would ruin the acoustics. <laughs> so, but uh, we did manage uh, to create uh, this uh, uh, electronic environment. Uh, which sounds like the cistern, mm -hmm. and uh, so we recorded and and, uh, uh, and and played in that 
Uh, and we, we did this for my 80th birthday in, in, two, in uh, 2012, where there were 600 people in the audience and they were all in, in the cistern. And uh, it, it was interesting because people had not had an experience like that. And, and this is something we had wanted to do for a long time, 25 years. <laughs> yeah, and, um, and I know that you've been teaching over the years. I know people who've taken your classes. And um, I had seen you at RPI, Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, tw more than, I think 20 some years ago. And I remember, I'm not a musician at all. I'm more of a visual artist by training okay. and um, and I do this TV show about <laughs> meditation but um, but I remember being really blown away by um, by the deep listening we were sitting in a studio space not dissimilar to this one mm -hmm. and you had us sit there and listen and I remember being blown away and going wow this is really a meditation practice this is really yes. meditation and I don't remember if at that time you were already calling it a meditation Yes, well, you already were. Yes, and um, being um, really, I don't know, just inspired or intrigued or whatever. And then recently, I was on about a year or two ago. I was on a long-term silent retreat, no mm -hmm. talking, no music, nothing. And um, behind certain sounds, like behind the vacuum cleaner noise or the sound of the shower, I was hearing music, and I was like. Oh, I kept thinking of you. I don't know if you you know if your ears were ringing, but you, I kept thinking of you. I was like, Pauline Oliveros, Pauline Oliveros, <laughs> deep listening, deep listening. And I kept, I couldn't, I, I kept thinking about that practice. Mm. And um, a year ago when I started the show, I just, I knew I wanted to have you on the show. And then when the confluence of events happened, um, that's mm -hmm. when I contacted you. But tell me a little bit about what the practice is for those people who aren't musical, or how does that? How does it work? Yeah. Well, first of all, um, some uh, more than 20 years ago, uh, actually it was 1991, um, I, uh, a friend of mine uh, who, uh, whose brother had a retreat center up in the Sangre de Cristo Mountains in New Mexico invited me to come up and do something. And um, so I thought, well, uh, how about a deep listening retreat? And, and of course, I had no idea what that would be, but uh, that's what I thought would be good, is to get a bunch of people together and, and retreat and uh, focus on listening. So that's what happened. Uh, this was at the Rose Mountain Retreat Center um, in, uh, in New Mexico. and. Uh, 8,000 feet up, so it was pretty high <laughs> to begin with. Um, and so there were 20 or so people who came to the retreat. And um, uh, I uh, sort of formulated ways of, of, uh, of listening. And, and meditation, um, in this sense, was... Uh, borrowed from uh, other traditional types of meditation, sitting meditation, sitting practice. But the, uh, the instruction was to listen to all of the sounds and try to expand as far as possible uh, to, in, to an inclusive kind of listening where there was no, uh, uh, no judgment or criticism or analysis uh, of the sounds, but simply to let them let let yourself uh, experience what the sounds, how they how they uh, uh, pass through your mind and body. Um, so this that was the focus of the meditation, and so uh, over the years uh, there have been many different uh, possibilities, and I. Uh, I, what I teach is the difference between hearing and listening, because hearing, um, I mean, the ear does not interpret sound. The ear simply uh, transduces the, the sound waves into electrical energy that is sent to the audio cortex in the brain. And uh, there are different, a variety of processes take, take place. 
uh, and there, uh, there is where what what the waves of what you experience is compared with your memory, of, uh, and if you have a memory of of a sound, well, then there's a certain resonance. Um, but if you have no memory of of the the sound that it, that is in your audio cortex, you may have uh, many different reactions, you know, and the, so that your your body responds in in a variety of ways. Huh? Um, and so what I'm teaching is uh, to uh, allow the experience as long as it's non-threatening, you know, and physically. I mean, you're safe. <laughs> so it's good to, to do this in a safe place, right? Um, and so that you 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 try to uh, uh, to do this without your mind uh, mind monkeys jumping all over the place, <laughs> but considering that that whatever passes through your mind is actually sound, and that you include it in your listening, um, and so this takes takes some practice. You know, to to be able to stay with that, and if if you if you can do that, you begin to um, you begin to develop a new new way, uh, new sensibility t uh, to the sounds, which it sounds like that's what happened to you, as you explained <laughs> it. Yeah. Right. My life was very dull at that time. <laughs> <laughs> so. You made sense. Uh, you made sense of the sound that you were experiencing. Yeah. Yeah. yeah um, I'd like to try it. Can we try that? Can what? Try it? listening? Yeah. To try a little bit of a deep listening kind of. Okay. So, t can you set us up a little bit and tell us what? Yes, we're doing? I'll, I'll. I will do that. I have to have my chime. Now. Okay. Okay. So, we'll do a short practice, um, and uh, I'm. I'm asking you to uh, be inclusive and non-judgmental. Lift off your judgments and uh, uh, not try to identify uh, what a sound is. Just simply experience it. Uh, and try to um, consider yourself in the center of uh, a sphere of sounds which come and go, and there are always sounds. There's always sounds, um, even even if it seems very quiet. There's still always some layer of sound which you can include in your listening. So, uh, so in saying that, I'm saying to be inclusive in your listening. There's also to be exclusive, which is to focus on the sound so that you you, you hear the very beginning, the middle, the end of the sound, and all of its detail. Um, but as soon as you've done that, then you return yourself to the uh, open and inclusive kind of listening. That's the practice. Okay. And uh, so I'm going to I'm going to give this a chime. Okay. Uh, so this will be the first. Uh, sound that you focus, you hear the beginning, middle, and end of the sound. Mm -hmm. When you when you when you experience the end of the sound, then you're beginning to try to expand and include everything you can possibly hear. Okay? Okay. All right, here we go.
Okay. So that's a, a brief uh, form of deep listening. We usually do much longer. How time. long? Oh, um, 20 to 30 minutes. Mm. Uh, and even longer. I do this all the time. So I say it's 24-7. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I'll tell you what I heard is I heard the bell. Mm -hmm. And I could hear it very distinctly in one ear and not the other because you're over here. Um, and then I could hear the like the subtle sounds of like the fans mm -hmm. and almost like like little cracking and popping around the room. Yes. Um, and then I became really aware of like a buzzing in my head, like mm -hmm. a, my, the ringing in my ears, which mm -hmm. I didn't even know I actually had. But mm -hmm. um, there was a lot, a lot of stuff in those few minutes. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yes, there always is. There yeah. always is. And um, because of masking, uh, which is, uh, we mask a lot of sound with, with our talking, you know, and... Um, Internal and external. Internal and external. Um, the, uh, the voice in the head. <laughs> and, but, of course, the uh, fact that we're talking now, you know, it masks all of the subtle uh, sounds that you did pick up during the meditation, yeah. And do you practice this in different environments? And oh, yes. You know, I mean, I guess you must notice, like, different sounds in different environments. Oh, my, my yes. Well, that was uh, particularly dramatic in terms of the, the uh, deep listening in the cistern, for example, where uh, anything you did was reflected back to you right away. <laughs> Does your living room and your kitchen sound different? Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, um, I'm, I'm going to try this at home. I'm going to try listening in the different rooms. I mean, I'm a meditator, um, but and I, and some of the meditation techniques do talk about sound or whatever it is. Yeah. But I can't say that I've actually tried to notice the difference in sound quality or sounds in my right. different rooms of right. my apartment. Well, your your ears actually do adjust and change. When you move from one environment to to another, you know, they do that uh, as part of their job of collecting sound, sonic information. Uh, so that's that's the job of the ear, uh, but then it has to to send it to the uh, audio cortex in the brain, and um, as I say, it takes it takes it takes time to interpret a sound. You know, um, when I say it takes time, it might be milliseconds, uh, uh, but th there are these time delays, so that it's what we what we think we're he hearing uh, has already passed, <laughs> but the, but the brain tries to present it to us as present. <laughs> right. Yeah. So. Yeah. So, um, do you? Um, when you teach this, you teach it a lot? Oh, well, I've been teaching deep listening now for, um, well, since 1991. Um, I have uh, a class at RPI which uh, is called deep listening. I've been teaching it now for 14 years there. Um, but then the, the summer retreats uh, were happening. Uh, right now, I have, uh, with my... Uh, uh, other two teachers, uh, Ione, who is here with us in the studio, she uh, teaches listening in dreams uh, as part of the retreat uh, and also of uh, the certification class that we teach, which is online now. Um, and uh, then there's Eloise Gold, who is uh, a Tai Chi and movement, creative movement specialist uh, and teaches listening through the body, uh, kinetic awareness. and uh, So we, the three of us together went on, on the treat, retreat uh, 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 teach these different aspects of, of the practice. And are people, uh, most of the participants, are they musicians, or is it it's kind of go really gone wide at this it's point? It's very wide 
So you don't know who's going <laughs> to yeah. show up. <laughs> um, some musicians are, are interested, and uh, but uh, it can be from any anything, any uh, practice at all. Yeah, doesn't matter. But we do we do uh, musical things, uh, improvisation, uh, uh, all sorts of things, composition. <laughs> and then so. um, with the the deep listening, I mean, what do you feel is like the benefit to it, or why would somebody want to pr practice, or why does this appeal? To well, uh, for me, uh, gives me a profound sense of of. Uh, uh, space where I am, um, but it also um, gives me information all the time. Every sound has got intelligence with it and information. So um, if I'm listening deeply, then uh, I know where I am. I mean, I have, I get information about place, but I also get information about uh, people and, and who they are and what what their uh, motivations are and so forth different all kinds of different information but I'm always listening so do you, I mean you, do you think more so than just listening to the words I mean what yes what do you, what profoundly do you more huh. um, what I also uh, am interested in is that the the newborn um, has more neurons than an adult. And <clears throat> what happens is that uh, as, soon, as soon as the baby is born, I mean, uh, they are urged towards communication, towards learning a speech sound. And <clears throat> sounds that don't have anything to do with speech are discarded along with the neurons. <laughs> And so <clears throat> speech and alphabet are, are uh, profoundly wonderful uh, tools of communication, but it, it, uh, what is sacrificed is the, the uh, knowledge that comes from sound and from, from actually listening to everything rather than just speech. Right. Yeah, that sounds um, remarkable, actually. I, I, I'm looking forward to trying that out, to mm -hmm. really listening mm -hmm. to people without listening to the words. Right, you know? exactly. And seeing if I can pick up anything. I imagine that after um, all these years, that maybe you're picking up something that the rest of us are sort of completely missing, but I well, no I, 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 do, I do think there's something to, to know, to, uh, to, to experience, mm -hmm. you know. It's very, I mean, it has to do with one's sensibility and uh, experience, yes. Mm. Right. Um, I mean, and then we have a lot of different languages, you know, that, and a lot of different meanings, a lot of different focus, you know. So different languages have different uh, uh, bias uh, toward the world and, and toward others and ways of communicating, you know, mm -hmm. so, but um, <clears throat> a lot is communicated by the sound of the words, but a lot of times that's missed. Sure. Yes, and um, we're out of time, Pauline. Oh. I know, didn't that go fast?